Okay, where we left off, you were talking about Good Morning America. Yeah, the, uh, we did some tape run-throughs of Good Morning America, and then we actually went on the air with, with a taped show that we taped uh, the night before because I was very nervous about going live with this thing. This is a brand new unit. These people had never worked together before, and I was uh, I didn't want an on-the-air catastrophe. So for, I believe it was two weeks, we taped the night before, which was... Uh, Convenient for me because my apartment was right across the street from ABC's studios on 66th Street. So I just used to go across the street in a bathrobe. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> it was right off the bat an immediate success because the tone of it was just so different. It was so accessible uh, compared to the Today Show, which has gotten kind of stodgy back in those days. And... Uh, you know, the cumulative effect of David, who is Mr. Warmth, and uh, really short, punchy newscasts, and these people that we had signed, and Irma Bombeck, and, and Geraldo, and Jack Anderson, and, uh, and we were doing kind of People magazine. I mean, it was a lot more pop culture than what you would get on the Today Show. And it, it just right off the bat, it just leapt out of the gate, and uh, I think it took about a a year to, to pass a NBC but we just we really were successful and the primetime lineup kind of uh, fed into it because people looked at ABC primetime with the audience that we were trying to reach in the morning and it was very easy to to direct our promotion on the air you know anybody who looked at Charlie's Angels would be interested in Farrah Fawcett will be on Good Morning America the next uh, and uh, it was fun for me because I hadn't worked on a show like this. This was kind of a news-related show. But it was good for me because I wasn't uh, burdened by all of the so-called conventions of doing news shows. I said, the hell with it. You know, this is not a news division show. We're going to do what we want to do. You know, although they did produce the newscasts. Uh, and occasionally, if we had uh, the vice president on or something, then uh, an ABC correspondent would do that interview. You know, we certainly wouldn't have Nancy Dusso do the, the interview. But uh, so that problem uh, straightened itself out pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, the other major problem was the daytime, which was uh, a mess. It just was uh, a hodgepodge. And I, uh, you know, my feeling was you just can't start with a clean slate. And what we had to do was basically take what we have and over a period of time make it work. And the first thing that I opted to do was to go ser to, to build toward an all serial schedule and really counter program ABC, uh, CBS, with hipper, younger kinds of uh, storylines. Because they were, you know, CBS was still kind of locked into the P&G mentality, which is very stodgy, and, uh, and I figured that we were going to go in a totally different direction. And I brought over a young woman who used to work for me at CBS by the name of Jacqueline Smith who was my uh, second in the children's area and later in, in daytime and made her the head of daytime and she was just a you know a dynamo I mean, she was terrific and I said the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take these two terrible shows uh, One Life to Live which is on at 2.30 and General Hospital which is on at 3 and they're half hours now and they're dying we're gonna expand them to 45 minutes because we have to make them feel like they're important, and the only way to do that quickly is to just have more of it. And nobody totally understood the logic of it, but uh, I think at this point they figured, what the we have nothing to lose. And so, you know, we hired new writers, refocused the shows on those characters that we thought had uh, potential, brought in new characters, and uh, it took about six months because we had to build new studios and everything to do this and put in the 90 minutes in place of, uh, of, of the hour. And, uh, and then uh, we also expanded. We had All My Children, which was uh, a half hour, and we made an hour out of that. So we picked up two half hours of cereal. And uh, at a point in time, though, you know, we were still short a half hour, and we couldn't do that until we got the 45-minute shows to work. So we had a group of cereals in the early afternoon, one game show, and another group of serials, which made absolutely no sense, but that uh, that we were forced to do this. 
until you know we felt that the 45 minute shows were ready to go to uh, an hour which took about another six months to a year then they they got expanded to uh, to an hour each and then we blocked out we had serials from uh, 1230 until 4 o'clock you know we had a show called Ryan's Hope which is a half hour an hour all my children an hour one life to live and an hour at general hospital and a testament to uh, um, Jackie Smith that she was able enough and creative enough that she just made these shows so popular she just kicked ass in the daytime I mean she was the one that thought up the Luke and Laura love story you know with Jeannie Francis and whoever the guy is who played on General Hospital yeah but she was the one that came up with all these stunts she was the one that came up with the catchword love in the afternoon and uh, and the show it took about uh, my whole time at ABC by the time I left there the daytime was clearly number one and just killed everybody in demographics and uh, we had a couple of game shows in the morning. You know, we, we developed Family Feud, which went on at that point in time, and into a big hit, and could never get this second game show right. There was a string of other shows, and I, you know, they just uh, came and went. But uh, but the daytime was uh, financially to ABC meant <clears throat> an enormous amount, because there were very little development costs involved. <clears throat> I mean, basically, we had the same shows that we had when I got there. But they were totally refurbished. They were expanded, and uh, and they were enormous hits. And uh, and that daytime schedule is on the air as we speak. It hasn't changed. They still have got all my children, uh, one life to live in General Hospital. And they have a general instead of Ryan's Hope. They have a half hour spinoff from General Hospital, <clears throat> and the View in the morning. They added, but basically the schedule is uh, pretty much the same schedule. That we created back then and uh, you know the last area you know which was kind of easy because it uh, could do this is where I came from was Saturday morning the children's area and it just uh, I mean it, it was basically doing what I did at, uh, at CBS primarily with Hanna-Barbera you know of, uh, of just we stole a couple of shows you know so I believe we stole uh, Scooby-Doo at a point in time which was a big acquisition uh, and uh, I think in one season you know that got turned around you know and uh, I, I was fortunate at, uh, at ABC that there were some good people already in place there uh, to do that and at that point in time you know as I got to, towards 1978 I uh, it was pretty much done and what I was really interested in doing, and I guess the uh, Good Morning America experience uh, had, had kind of influenced me quite a bit. I really wanted to get more involved in the news area. And I had a couple of conversations with Fred Pierce, who looked at me like I was a Martian, you know, when I suggested this. So what the hell do you want to get involved in news for? And I don't think he understood that I started to get very, very bored. It was... Uh, I mean, it was, and also I was getting very tired because I missed a Michael Eisner not being there. I mean, it was twice as much work. I found myself spending twice as much time in Los Angeles, you know, and I was used to running the whole thing from New York. And uh, I just was getting worn out, and I wasn't, I, and he, I wasn't getting the response that I hoped I would hear, you know, about, uh, about the news. You know, which at this point they hadn't, they hadn't hired Runeology yet. You know, so it was still up in the air. And uh, so the, the, the stage was kind of set, you know, to move over to NBC in 78. Now, before you made that move in 77, you made the cover of Time magazine. Uh, and They dubbed you the man with the golden gut. What does that phrase mean to you? I hate it. Really? Yeah, I am. But as I've gotten older, I hate it more because I'm really getting a big gut. Nothing to do with gold. But uh, I don't know. That's something that somebody, uh, it's one of the program executives over at ABC was quoted. That was a quote of hers. And I've, uh, you know, to this day, it still kind of haunts me. 
But that has nothing to do with the gut. It really has a lot to do with uh, a very, very high learning curve and learning an awful lot about a lot of it is kind of you learn from experience. It has nothing to do with your gut. I mean, I think the gut can enter into it to a point, but there's a lot more that's called upon to make any kind of a reasoned uh, decision about something. Well, let's talk about some of the specific shows and some of the producers that you've just touched on briefly. Um, pro and con, talk a bit about what putting Charlie's Angels on the air represented to you and to the network. It represented a major hit, one of the first hits. You know, you don't put too many 50 share shows on the air. <clears throat> this was a big hit. It, uh, I still believe this is uh, Charlie's Angels was a, a very, very positive statement for the women's movement. I mean, this was the first show where there were three women who were kind of running things and doing things on their own. They were out in the field. They didn't have time to check with Charlie or Bosley. They just went out and they did it. And, uh, and it was a big hit, and it was bright, and it was, at the time, very, very fresh. And, uh, I mean, I, there was nothing to be ashamed of there. Now, this show was, I guess, towards the beginning of your relationship with an important producer at ABC, Aaron Spelling. Talk a bit about working with Aaron Spelling. Well, he was a joy to work with. I mean, he was a, a total professional, and... Uh, you know, he just, uh, if he put his mind to it, he could do almost anything. I mean, he is the guy that delivered family every week to us, you know, which won Emmy Awards. You know, he is, uh, he's the guy that not too long ago uh, did uh, the HBO movie uh, about AIDS, The Boys in the Band. And Ben plays on. Ben, ben plays on, yeah. So... And, and, you know, you give them something like uh, Charlie's Angels. You know, we need a little bit of style and a little bit of fun, and, and he was, there's nobody better. You know, and he, you know, we got to the action-adventure stuff, the Starsky and Hutches and Love Boat and Fantasy Island. I mean, he produced the hell out of these shows. And, uh, and I don't think he's ever been totally appreciated. He's brought a lot of, a lot of entertainment to a lot of people. Uh... And he was a major supplier. Now, on the comedy side, whereas at uh, CBS you had your Norman Lear and your Brooks and Burns and your Larry Gelbart, one of your main players at ABC was Gary Marshall. Gary yeah, was, uh, yeah, he was the main player. He was, uh, he was great. He was, uh, and he could do a certain kind of comedy. You know, he kind of a raucous comedy, Happy Days, sentimental comedy. Laverne and Shirley. You know, he had done, before I got there, The Odd Couple, and he was involved in the development and execution of that uh, show. Uh, he did a couple of other lesser shows that just uh, never went anywhere, you know, that ultimately got canceled, but he was important. Danny Arnold, who did uh, Barney Miller, and, uh, and, uh, and he also did Fish for a couple of seasons. You know, he was a great producer. Yeah, I think Danny Arnold's one of the best comedies that have ever been presented on television. You know, there are, it's on now on, uh, on TV Land, and it's, it's, those shows still hold up very well. So uh, he was uh, very important. Uh, you know, the guys who produced uh, All in the Family from Norman, Nichols Ross West did Three's Company. You know, a lot of people forget that, that the, you know, they, their vocabulary in comedy was very, very broad to go from an all in the family to a threes company. You know, and I know it's something that Larry Gilbert doesn't want to admit to in his, uh, in his biography, but uh, he was the one that wrote the good pilot script for threes company. Mr. Gilbert of MASH fame. Is that true? Never, oh, yeah, he never talks about it, but he did. Wrote a great script for that. Uh, and, I, and I think that the Universal Studio, just as a studio, turned out some really good material for us. You know, they did uh, uh, Nancy Drew. They did the Bionic shows, uh, two of them. They did Beretta. You know, there's some really good shows that came out and put a lot of money into those shows. Uh, and then there were individual producers that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Crofts, made a major contribution to our schedule with, uh, with Donnie and Marie. 
in their own crazy way. Talk a bit about Donnie and Marie. Obviously, you have a real fondness for the variety show format. Uh, at that point in time, what did you sort of see? What did you project as the life ex expectancy just for that genre? Obviously, you had great success with Sonny and Cher and Donnie and Marie as well. What, well, were, you, what were you thinking was going to happen with the variety show? Well, I thought specifically Donnie and Marie could be around for four or five years until they outgrow it. And I think that act could, uh, could get stale when they're standing there, they're 23 years old. Uh, but I felt that, that variety could, uh, could evolve from star variety to concept. And we spent an enormous amount of money uh, trying to come up with forms that could, uh, that could work. I mean, we did one show that uh, almost got on the air. But the testing killed it, called That Thing on ABC. And it was uh, a lot of really good people were, were in there. But people later went on to SCTV, and, uh, and it, didn't, it didn't totally work. But uh, we did several concept shows. We tried a show with Red Fox, which was just wrong for the network. I mean, he was just the, the wrong kind of personality. Uh, we tried variety specials uh, with some comedy in there with uh, Lola Falana. Uh, I, as I say, Cass Elliot, had she not died, I mean, I was prepared to put her on the air, that she did a, a show that her, her manager, Alan Carr, who later went on to produce uh, Grease, the movie, uh, was a great show. I mean, really, she was born to be on television, Cass Elliot. I don't know whether you remember her, but she's very, very large and... Uh, Great sense of humor, yet the audience loved her, and could have been a big hit. Could have been the next the big variety show if she, you know, hadn't passed away. But uh, I just always I felt that the variety uh, form, you know, should continue. And I went to NBC; it did continue. You know, where we did shows like the Mandrell Show, uh, and I even brought Marie back for a short-lived uh, show. And I, I have a feeling that in the next uh, couple of years that, you know, Saturday Night Live is enjoying a renaissance, The Mad Show is doing pretty well as its competition, that you're going to see some concept variety shows and maybe even a personality-dominated show. You know, a guy like Steve Harvey, they're talking about doing a variety show. I mean, he's done, I don't know how many years of the family of, of his comedy. He'd be a great variety artist. Could be a big hit, uh, and I I think somebody will do that. You know I think uh, you know the fact is if if they don't do it then they lose them to the movies. You know and I uh, there's some of these some of these people it's like uh, the Wayans kids could do a variety for them and cross over. Uh, but to me the variety show has always represented show business in television. And I'm really sorry to see that there's so little but on the air now. It's just, it's, uh, it's too bad. And I, I do think that, uh, that it's, by necessity, it's going to have to come back. Because obviously, the audience is telling us something about half-hour comedies. You know, when the last successful one was Dahmer and Greg on ABC and uh, NBC, I'm not convinced that they have anything this year. Uh... You know, there's just such a high rate of failure. These shows are so bad that uh, you know, maybe the time is, is, is now to think about going back. Another genre, you, talk, you touched a bit on family, but that family dramas um, were certainly uh, a good part of what was succeeding on your schedule, not just with family, but um, Eight is Enough. Yeah, Eight is Enough. Was, I left that out. But... Uh, Talk about why you think these shows were popular with your viewers. Well, they were popular because there was strong identification. A show like Eight is Enough, you know, the kids on that show had problems, and the parents that uh, the average parent or, or child at home could identify with. I mean, it's basically the appeal of Seventh Heaven. I don't think Seventh Heaven in its own way is that different from Eight is Enough in terms of form. And I, quite frankly, am surprised that there are only a handful on the schedule. You know, the WB has got Seventh Heaven, and they've got the uh, Gilmore Girls, and uh, that's about it. That's, uh, 
I don't, I don't think there's anything else on. Now, I understand a lot of, a lot of shows are being developed in this genre for next fall. So it may change. But uh, I'm surprised that they haven't, you know, nobody has uh, done it before. One of the shows that you touched on that was a huge success for you was Three's Company. How involved uh, were you with the casting of this show, particularly with John Ritter's being cast? Well, I suggested John because he, uh, he used to be on the Waltons. He played a minister on the Waltons, so I knew he was very versatile and, uh, and very, you know, he, he could do comedy, and I, I suggested they test him, and, uh, and he was great. But I was uh, very involved in the casting of Suzanne Summers that we had finally decided. We did three pilots. And it took the Larry Gobot script to be the one that uh, we, we, we made. And, and the uh, Chrissy character still wasn't right. And so we got to the day before we are starting the production of the series. We didn't have a Chrissy. And I was so desperate, I took all the, t all the audition tapes. I just kind of fast forwarded them, and all of a sudden, they went by Suzanne Summers, who I hadn't seen. But I recognized her from an appearance on The Tonight Show and said, back that up. And backed it up, and she was great. She'd been passed on. And I, I, I said, I don't understand. She, this girl could, could play that part. Why was she passed on? And I, don't, I, I couldn't get a straight answer. At any rate, you know, we, uh, we got her in that day, and she was on the set tomorrow. And, that, uh, and she was terrific in that part. And that was an accident, you know, because she should never have gotten the part. Uh, but that was a show that, uh, that was in development. Uh, there was a woman by the name of Bridget Potter in the East who later went on to do the programming for HBO in, in the East, who was working on the development of that show long before I got to ABC and always believed in it. Then it was called uh, uh, Man About the House. It's an old English series and uh, was convinced that it could work. And, uh, and ultimately, we got it on, and it was the number one show. I mean, it was a bigger hit than uh, Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. And totally condemned. Everybody hated it. All the critics hated it. They, uh, they really uh, just hated the show. I made the mistake once of comparing it to Moliere, and I never lived, I never lived that down in the sense that it was a farce and uh, that was, uh, wasn't the best thing for me to do. Um, let's talk about some of the event programming that you had touched on before. Um, talk about uh, Rich Man, Poor Man and the way that had been, that, the way that came into being and the way it was scheduled. <clears throat> well, Rich Man, Poor Man was there. You know, when I, when I got there, it was uh, six two-hour movies. <laughs> and I, I was just uh, looking. We were very short on series programs. And I just thought we'd get more bang for our buck, you know, to, put, to go back to back with another hour drama and to play it on a weekly basis. So that we started with a two-hour and we ended with a two-hour, but all the other shows, the other eight shows, played as single hours. And it enabled us to back it up. I believe we put it at 10 o'clock to put a, a, a really good new show at 9 o'clock uh, with the hope that people would pre-tune in and we could help build another show. And, uh, and it, it worked pretty well. I forget what show we put on uh, earlier. But, uh, but it was a big hit. It was a very, very good show that I had absolutely nothing to do with. I mean, that was a Brandon Stoddard show. But it was first rate. But in terms of the scheduling... Uh, it was on every Monday. Um, had, was there any precedent for programming a miniseries in that way? <laughs> well, usually, they, I think they thought they were going to put it on uh, in movie time periods. So I would say probably not. <coughs> I just wanted to get more use out of it. And this, uh, this eked out another... It would have played in six states, and this played in uh, two... Ten dates. <coughs> so, I, I I thought this is the better way to do, it, and it worked pretty well. We'll never know how it would have worked the other way. Um, similarly, talk about where Roots was, at what stage of development it was when you joined ABC. 
They had uh, they had ordered uh, some scripts, and we're working with uh, Alex Haley and Bill Blinn and uh, Ernest Canoy on scripts. I think initially they ordered uh, either four or six hours, and I got there, and I I wanted to make the deal uh, before I got to ABC, and I was too late. I saw Alex uh, Haley on uh, the Tomorrow Show with uh, Tom Snyder. But uh, got there too late, and I, but I thought was delighted that it was there. And what happened is every other week, Brandon Stoddard would come in and say, we need another hour. We need another hour. We need another. And so we went, it started at, uh, I think it was six hours, and ended up at 12 hours. But, uh, but I didn't buy it, but I was very much involved in the development and ended up saying, go ahead and make it. But being nervous as can be about it, the 12 hours of this. But, uh, but I, I love the property. And when I, I saw the film and I looked at all of it in one weekend, I looked at all 12 hours, the rough cut, and really got caught up in it. And I was uh, very nervous about putting it into a sweet period. I just didn't know how the audience would respond to the subject matter. And uh, I said, and I, didn't, I wasn't sure what to do, but I said, you know, I looked at this thing over a weekend, and maybe the best thing to do is to back into January and play this over one week. Play the 12 hours. It's over a, your whole schedule. Well, it wasn't a whole schedule. You know, we opened with a two-hour on Sunday, and we closed with a two-hour. And, uh, and I believe everything else was one hour. But there may have been one two-hour during the week. I, I don't... Uh, uh, but we kind of put together a patchwork, which David Wolpe hated. He just hated the way it was scheduled. Hated it. But we did it in one week, played the whole thing off with major, major promotion, you know, all big time magazine covers and, uh, and it went on the air and it was absolutely gigantic. It helped that we had uh, blizzards all over the country that week. So a lot of people were snowed in and, uh, but it just kind of tapped a chord that I didn't call or I would have put it in February. You know, as it is, we got 70 shares in January, which didn't do us a hell of a lot of good in the sweep, and I never heard the end of it from the affiliates. How could you be that stupid to put this on? I mean, you know, which is great in hindsight, but uh, but a lot of people saw it. It was it was great, a uh, great piece of work. Really, it was wonderful. And I think that's the end of this tape. <laughs>